Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you here again. I'm glad to see a packed audience. And uh, hello also to those of you that are following in live stream. I'm Paola Antonelli. I am at the director of R&D at MoMA. But R&D is not the usual R&D. It's more an attempt to prove that museums can be the R&D of society. And as you know, we're, doing, we're having these salons to discuss matters that are urgent and that are in everybody's mind. And I bet you that grace in whichever uh, definition you use it is in your mind. So first of all, I would like to say a few words about this beautiful image. It's by Paul Pfeiffer, by artist Paul Pfeiffer. And it is a series of pictures that uh, he manipulated, taking NBA archival photograph and taking out all of the accoutrements, the ball, the basket, only leaving the bodies of the athletes. And this one in particular is really characteristically almost like a crucifix. And showing grace in action, grace under pressure. It's almost like an iconic image of what grace under pressure could be. And it's something that I think uh, is really resonating with all of us. But in truth, I'm going to leave for a moment a black slide here because I would like to just acknowledge we're in a pressure cooker right now. There's so many tensions that are uh, just really exploding everywhere and people that are really uh, trying to understand how to survive, not only to be under pressure, but how to survive. So this idea of grace, I'm sure, is in everybody's mind, whether you're thinking of the divine grace that is going to sustain us, if you believe, or the grace that it takes to talk with other people, to just live together. And you know, I want to acknowledge the fact that New Yorkers are known to be rude all over the world, but in truth, they're full of grace. And I, 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 that's why I love to be in this city. If there are people that usually know how to live with grace under pressure, it's New Yorkers. But lately, even New Yorkers have abandoned this kind of way of living. And so I want us to get back on track. I want us to think about what grace means to us. You know, I remember I was here for 9-11, and I remember how people became really gracious towards each other afterwards, like really caring. And I remember also what happened when, uh, you know, we all went through this kind of like collective psychological roller coaster of like stunned silence and then trying to understand what to do. And then I remember this cover that today would be so politically incorrect, December 2001 by Mara Kalman and Rick Marovitz, that all of a sudden made New York into almost like the motto, the JFK, ich bin ein Berliner. It's like we're all Muslim to kind of like try to reconnect all the tears that had happened within the New York community. And uh, it's just this fabulous, you know, the Fatushis, then you had the Pashmina in the Upper East Side with the, sh with the Shatush, uh, really, like in, in the 70, 71st Street and stuff. But, and I remember I organized that, at that time uh, a, a gathering like this that was entitled, How Did You Know That It Was Time to Laugh Again? So it really is beautiful to see how New Yorkers are in tune with their emotions and with their love for each other. I mean, sometimes they go a little overboard. But then there's been many other examples all over the world of grace under pressure during COVID. Here you have two examples, New York and then Naples, excuse me. Uh, and then, you know, Hurricane Sandy here in New York City and the blackout. There are so many different examples that I can remember of people reacting collectively with grace under pressure. So this is something that I would like to discuss also tonight. What does it mean to have collective grace under pressure? And then, of course, January 6th. This is Representative Andy Kim from New Jersey on uh, the early morning of January 7, helping clean up the rotunda of the Capitol, right? So the reaction that one can have under these kind of circumstances, and we're seeing what's happening right now all over the world from Ukraine to Gaza and beyond, is really one of trying to be as gracious, not graceful, also graceful, but as gracious as possible to the people around you. So grace, you know, just right now, Bill T. Jones asked me, what kind of definition do we all agree on when it comes to grace? I'm like, none, it's your definition. What do you mean? I thought we were all speaking the same language. Not really. Uh, we all have a different idea of grace, I'm sure. 
And that's why the four people that are here tonight will, will all have this, those ideas. But then we also have some video makers. And you know, you know Grace under pressure, you know, they say that Hemingway coined this, uh, this term. And in, that, in his case, it was about courage. It was the matador. It was the corrida, you know. So it was the toreador. Then you know, we'll see Eduardo Con that will talk about trees and the forest. And to him, Grace is harmony. To a neurosurgeon that you'll see afterwards, it's about focus. It's about forgetting everything else and focusing on the surgery at, at, uh, at, at hand. It can be empathy, communication, the ability to be diplomatic, compromise, nonviolence, diplomacy. Uh, but also it could be submissiveness. You know? So we should also talk about when does grace become acquiescence and when does it become arrogance or hubris? It's important right now. You know, many times we kind of like hide in grace and graciousness not to, to avoid real conflict, right? So uh, when do we have to abandon grace? And also, you know, we'll talk about divine grace. We have an expert here tonight, but it's interesting to uh, consider the fact that divine grace is, of course, a Christian, Orthodox, and some Protestant notion, but it's also Islamic because the Quran talks about God as the possessor of infinite grace that can bestow his grace upon whom, whomsoever he wills or desires. So it cuts across, and divine grace is the one that's sustained, that is like given as a gift to humans and sustains them through hard times. So when we think of grace in the American context, we think a lot of Martin Luther King. And you know, Martin Luther, Luther King also says that he owed a lot to Mahatma Gandhi, right? And he said very beautifully that Mahatma Gandhi was the first person to transform Christian love into a powerful force for social change. Interestingly, Gandhi was not Christian, but uh, Martin Luther King saw this idea of nonviolence and grace as a weapon to undo evil, because what he said that he fought against was pure evil, not individual human beings. And interestingly, uh, you know, there's this uh, idea that there was a juxtaposition between him and Malcolm X uh, that is much more subtle than is told, but it's very similar to the juxtaposition that had happened in India between Gandhi and Ambedkar. I always have to remind myself how to say an Ambedkar, who was kind of the Malcolm X uh, of India in terms of the separatism of caste and his advocacy of his own caste. So it's interesting to see how grace sometimes is used and considered a weapon, in some other cases is kind of ridiculed as acquiescence by some. But so it, it also leads me to talk about the, the other manifestations of grace. Art is a manifestation of grace to many, at least in some cases, and so is music. And especially in the black American experience, music has been used as grace as a weapon or grace as a defense. Um, of course, you know, music is something that has been important to the civil rights movement and to black Americans way before there was an American nation. Uh, during the slave trade across the Atlantic. Music is something that was fused from the African tradition when it met the Christian tradition, and that's how the spirituals were born. But music was very important, a way of giving hope. And hope is a powerful engine to go forward living. It provided uh, slaves an escape from their lives. It was a way to build community. It was a way to reinforce spiritual practices and beliefs. It was a tool that helped that also send coded messages in some cases, and that was across, uh, across the world. And communicate with allies and sometimes even persuade. How many people have been moved by spirituals no matter what? Music is such a powerful way to get under people's skins and beyond their blood-brain barriers. So, it really is important, and We Shall Overcome, for instance, is a great example of that. These are demonstrators that are singing it at Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream when he just delivered I Have a Dream. We Shall Overcome was coming from the South, and it was initially a folk song. And Amazing Grace, you know, I don't know how many of you have seen this documentary. It's just transcendental. It's incredible. An Amazing Grace is another example of a poem that comes from 1772 that describes the joy and peace 
of a soul uplifted from despair to salvation through the gift of grace. And in that case, Who was a slave it is through music. Captain. It was, yeah, thank the you. The only reason that he stopped being a slave captain was because he got so sick. Good. And he would have continued selling people mm -hmm. if he had not died. Uh, I was hoping you will help us with that story. Good. Amazing we'll get to that, I'll uh, remind himself, you. Actually. And I didn't know, so thank yeah. you for saying that. Uh, you know, this is interesting. So Bill told me that Amazing Grace is a big bit of an insult, and I didn't know it. So thank you for saying good, that. And we'll bring it relations. up. Huh? Good public relations. Yes. Well, that, yeah, good public relations. That's good. Thank you. All right. So, I mean, I love to stand corrected because, you know, and uh, Christina knows it. I went through this particular set of slides 15 times because it's always like it's, it's complicated. And here you go. So thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, I appreciate it. So Carrie Mae Weems wrote, um, the, the, performed and wrote this particular piece after hearing Obama sing Amazing Grace at the funeral for Clementa Pickening, uh, the Reverend Clementa Pickening that had been killed um, at uh, the, um, um, in the June 2015 shooting. I can't remember which city it was. But so she wrote this to really think of what the concept of grace could be. But art beyond music can be a vessel for grace and for giving hope to, uh, to people that are dispossessed or in a situation of uh, indentured slavery or any way of like discrimination. And another example is Elio Itisica in Brazil in the late 1960s during the dictatorship when he took the people from Mangueira, from the favela, and uh, gave them these paragoles that were these capes that were meant to let them express themselves with their colors and with their ways of moving. And then he asked them to come down to the Museum of Modern Art in Rio, where they were not allowed to walk in. So they remained outside performing this gesture of division and kind of like showing with their grace their superiority or at least their equality in power. So it's fascinating how art in all its forms is really a way to move beyond separation and reestablish equilibrium in power. Now, grace under pressure. It's, it is said that Jackie Kennedy talked about her husband saying that he was the very personification of strength and grace under pressure, of dignity, nobility, and majesty, of gallantry and composure, of duty and self-sacrifice. Now, it kind of like makes me a little itchy knowing what he was doing to her, but no matter what, uh, she actually said that. And you know, the missile crisis, the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 22, 1962 is an example of two people being able to talk directly, you know, Nikita Khrushchev and JFK, and sess each other out, trying to understand where the other person stood. Is it a grace ballet? Who knows? It, it is being told to us that way. Definitely, it's a different way to diplomacy, and it's a case in which graciousness, perhaps, in their own way, was able to kind of save the world or save the day for sure. Then there's the kind of soft diplomacy. Give an example, the panda diplomacy. I don't know if you know, but the last two pandas that were here in the United States on loan uh, have been returned to China. There's a little bit of a like freezing in the relationship with China. I mean, since 1972, there's always been Chinese pandas in the United States because China is the only country that has the panda and they lend them. So this is a sign of a real breakage in the relationship. But there are many other examples of diplomacy through means that are considered soft. And then there's the embodiment of grace. You know, now we're going to the gendering of grace. So here are a series of really fierce women, diplomats, that nonetheless had to play the game of being graceful. Madeleine Albright with her pins. Audrey Hepburn, she became a UNESCO. She was the embodiment of grace when she was young, and then she became a UNESCO ambassador, Josephine Baquer, uh, this kind of like translator of so many uh, interpretations of different cultures, and then so important from the for the French resistance, she became a spy for the French resistance during World War II. And last but not least, Jackie Kennedy, that uh, 
we all remember in, in her pink dress that was bloodied with the, the blood of her husband when he was killed. Um, but still, there's this introduction of the gendering of grace that becomes even more, even clearer when it comes to certain professions like model. This is Doniale Luna, a wonderful black model from the 1960s, or geisha. Kiharo Nakamura is the one that wrote memoirs of a geisha, or ballerina. Carla Fracci, I grew up with her, so I need to, I needed to have her. But so these are kind of the ideas of grace, and it becomes immediately very, very female, at least in the binary world that we had until a few years ago. Today is very different. I can think of grace and see. Um, you know, non-binary people, but it was not like that that way. But one example of the gendering is the Brett Kavanaugh hearings when, uh, um, when oh boy, yeah, Christine Blasey Ford was very poised. So a woman has to be poised while Brett Kavanaugh was having that hysterical break breakdown. And in the end, he got through. So just look at this particular situation, right? So the poise, the grace, and the gendering of it all. Um, and here is one beautiful juxtaposition. So Emily Post that wrote the etiquette book that was a, teaching women how they should behave with grace and poise and elegance. And instead, Audre Lorde, the wonderful black lesbian feminist that wrote this book, this short book, The Master's Tool Will Never Dismantle the Master's House, that uh, has this almost mathematical syllogism. She says, what does it mean when the tools of a racist patriarchy are used to examine the fruits of that same patriarchy? It means that only the most narrow parameters of change are possible and allowable. So this idea that if you want to change things, you have to use new tools. You cannot use the tools of before. So even the concept of grace will have to be rethought. And one way to rethink it is to think of nature, of loving the alien, right? Of just thinking of other beings. So this is my octopus teacher. I think everybody has seen it, and those who haven't, oh my god, right? So the idea of trying to learn from other species. Or uh, we have here, actually, the author of this beautiful drawing here. Uh, but the idea of bodies of water, the idea that we are made of water, and therefore, just understanding that we flow with the rivers and with the ocean establishes a new ethical relationship with the rest of nature. And this is called posthuman feminist phenomenology, but it should be besides feminism. It should be really about everyone and beyond human. Um, and this is Paola Villaplana de Miguel, who's a colleague of ours in architecture and design that made this concept image that was for a biennale called Bodies of Water. And this is the uterus. This is a uterus that flows into the rest of nature. So, Finding new ways to understand grace, um, this is a little more well known, you know, the idea of connecting with trees, connecting with mushrooms. We know that mushrooms have these networks that can teach us so much about living collectively. But you see, there are so many different notions, and I have probably confused you more than you even were when you came here, but that's okay, because tonight, these people are going to explain everything to us, you know? so. We have, uh, you know, I'll just uh, talk about them in the way that you see them here. We have Leonardo Bravo, who's the director. I'm so bad at titles. He's my colleague, so I should know, but he's the director of public engagement in the Department of Learning and Engagement here at MoMA. But in truth, I consider him a diplomat that tries to show what this kind of massive thing in Midtown can do for people that are all over in communities all over the city and beyond. Then we have Willie James Jennings, who's the Associate Professor of Systematic Theology and Africana Studies at Yale Divinity School, and an ordained Baptist minister. So he's going to explain to us that concept of grace. Then we have Bill T. Jones, who you've already heard some of. You know, he's so intimidating, but I adore him. He's, a, he's an artist. He's an artist, choreographer, dancer, theater director, writer, and also a great interviewer. I was just, uh, you know, if you don't, uh, if you haven't gone to the sessions that he has, Bill talks. It's like Bill the, talks. Bill talks. 
at uh, New York Live Arts, you're missing something, so you should really go because they're riveting. And last but not least, Cameron Russell, who is a, a recent friend and a really impressive human being. She used to be a supermodel, so you might recognize her, but she was also always um, an organizer, like a labor organizer and an activist, and now uh, very much an environmental justice expert. And uh, then we will also have a few videos from Verna Kale, who's a Hemingway expert, Eduardo Cohn, beloved anthropologist that will send us a video from the Ecuadorian forest, Mark McLaughlin, neurosurgeon, hello, and Ocean Ramsey, uh, just extraordinary person. You will see what she does. So we're gonna start right now with a video from Verna Kale. In Profiles in Courage, in 1955, future President Kennedy credited American writer Ernest Hemingway with coining the phrase grace under pressure to describe that most admirable of human virtues, courage. Um, if Hemingway wasn't the first person to say this phrase, he certainly made it his own. And he was quoted um, for saying it in numerous publications, including The New Yorker, um, he also wrote it in a 1926 letter to his friend, F. Scott Fitzgerald, who had asked him something about guts. And he said, guts never made any money for anybody except violin string manufacturers. Was not talking about guts, but rather something else. Grace under pressure. So guts, grace under pressure, courage. Uh, what's the difference? Um, guts, I think, is when you do the scary thing like you cross the Atlantic on a transport ship, or you pick up literal guts as part of the uh, Red Cross ambulance service. Um, but uh, was it guts that made him give up journalism to write or to write The Sun Also Rises, but then refuse to hand it over to his publisher um, to get himself released from his first book contract because uh, he didn't feel like that publisher believed in him? to, you know, to be willing to walk away. And we have to keep in mind, he wasn't famous yet when he did these things. And that's the difference. To do the scary thing because you have to is guts. But to do the scary thing when you could quit or you could compromise or you could take an easier route, um, that's grace under pressure. And so uh, I think to Hemingway, facing the pressure that comes from outside is guts. But facing the pressure from inside being true to yourself, um, that's, that's grace under pressure. And that was the code he lived by as an artist. And it's a code that some of his most memorable characters lived by in his work. And I think that's why Hemingway is still relevant today um, and has managed to be such a controversial figure and um, someone who is still thought provoking almost a century later. Thanks, please. <laughs> it is a joy to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. And thank you all for coming. Oops. Grace is the only true enemy of fear. Not enough people know this. I know this truth about grace because it lives in Christian faith and practice. It is a truth that lives in other places as well. But this is where I know it. Grace is first and foremost presence, beginning with divine presence. Divine presence that exists in the midst of contradiction. The most significant contradiction is life that is meant to be lived in a shared project of thriving and peacemaking, but exists for us in violence, greed, hatred, and segregation. If grace is the gift of God's presence, as noted in Christian traditions and other religious traditions as well, 
then it is also the gift of human presence. Grace is what we offer to one another by being present to one another amid contradiction. The great mystic and theologian Howard Thurman understood that fear mangles the mind and distorts our subjectivity. Fear also drives the creation of structures of death, from weapons to public policies, from policing practice to the practices of real estate and development that slice through flesh and spirit, dividing us from ourselves, dividing us from one another, and of course the earth. But grace summons mind and body to a new place of shared habitation. It is this summons, my friends, at the heart of grace that interests me because hearing that summons has allowed so many oppressed peoples to do the seemingly impossible thing and that is to make pain and suffering productive. As I have learned from so many African American and African diaspora and indigenous peoples, to make pain and suffering productive is never to justify its existence as necessary or meaningful and certainly not providential. It is to turn it, bend it if you will, toward life toward a shared striving for living as testified to in the last lines of the magisterial poem by Lucille Clifton entitled Miss Rosie, where she states, I stand up through your destruction. I stand up. Or we can hear it in the wise words of the poet Ross Gay, who tells us that joy and despair are often joined and who asks, the question, the question, what if we joined each other in our joy and sorrow? This is grace and grace work, the joining together in shared living and contradiction. Grace, however, can be denied. Indeed, this may be the most important social fact of our time that grace is being denied. Fundamentally, grace is being denied by our built environments, how we design and build habitation in ways that structure fear and promote hatred, greed, and violence, that, promote, that, that promote racism and sexism of place as the late, great Bell Hooks so powerfully railed against. We deny presence. We deny the shared work of being present to one another in ways that commit us to shared thriving, to join work of living. This is what I call the problem of the line, the line that forms the border, the line that forms property relations, and the line that creates the prison. Each line, each line, my friend, has become a burden too much for the human spirit to bear, a burden that keeps us from designing habitation that would articulate shared care among humans and among all other creatures. Yet the summons at the heart of grace remains. That summons says to us, even now, at this moment, we can build grace. Thank you very much. And now we have um, a video from neurosurgeon Mark McLaughlin. Uh, my name is Mark McLaughlin. I'm a neurosurgeon in the Princeton, New Jersey area, and I do brain and spine surgery. And 
my thoughts on grace under pressure are really when something in the OR or when I'm taking care of a patient, but primarily when I'm in the OR, something doesn't go as planned, uh, something that is potentially could be viewed as, as not going right or could be a, a complication. Uh, my, my feeling that grace under pressure is really when I, when that happens, I need to suspend judgment on that. I need to not judge it as a good or bad event, not judge it as an omen or, um, or something untoward and really to just be in that moment, what needs to happen next? Really, truly just focusing on, okay, this event has happened. Now, what do I need to do? If I let my mind wander into the future and start thinking about whether, wow, this could, this could lead to a, a bigger problem or this could lead to a neurological deficit or a longer hospitalization or a family's poor judgment of me, that just completely gets in the way of my performance. So I'm looking for optimal performance and optimal performance lives in the present moment. I always love the Rudyard Kipling poem, If, you know, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. Triumph, like thinking some operation is gonna be fantastic or worrying about an operation having a terrible complication, both of which are in the future. They're not in the present moment and they, they get in the way of performance. So I focus on the present. I am grateful for the past. I am accepting of the present and I take responsibility for the future. And those are my goals as a surgeon and as a person. And I strive for them every day. Hope this helps. Thank you. Many different ideas of grace, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> so, and now it's time for Cameron Russell. Thank you, Paolo, and thank you, Christina. Um, this is a wonderful provocation, and uh, I can't believe I'm in such a uh, wise company. So I hope to exhibit grace under pressure. <laughs> uh, so I've been a model for 20 years, and I have come to understand the fashion industry as not exceptionally racist or exceptionally patriarchal or uh, paying exceptionally low wages or exceptionally polluting. Um, like many industries, it can be all of those things. But what is exceptional is that despite all that, fashion speaks the language of fantasy and beauty and grace. And I think in this moment, uh, when so many institutions and industries and governments are failing to address our deepest concerns, many of us find ourselves asking a similar question, which is how do I show up for my job or the polls or even family dinner when the expectation of grace is so at odds with where my heart and my mind are? So I'm actually too awkward and too loud and my winter coats are too big to embody grace very often. But <laughs> I can tell you uh, how it went from a superficial performance I did for my job to something that I believe is an important and a useful ambition. So my parents raised me to be the toughest. They gave me a boy's name. They gave me a bowl cut. In middle school, when they wouldn't let me join the football team, I marched around telling every teacher, this is a Title IX violation, until they created a touch team that I could join. So when I started modeling at 16, and the expectations were that I was quiet and agreeable and demure, this could not have been further away from who I was. And actually, nobody tells you how to model. It's supposed to be what you are. But uh, although it is not supposed to be a skill, the skills that I had picked up being an ambitious kid prepared me well. So when they wanted me to make out with a stranger in front of a crew of 100 people for a camera before I had ever kissed anyone, I thought, okay, I'm tough. I've seen a lot of movies. 
uh, when they wanted me to shoot with an art director who watched me change all day on set uh, after hours, I thought, I'm fearless, okay. At the height of her power, Cassius Dio described Cleopatra when she was in the prime of her youth. She was most striking, possessed a most charming voice, and knowledge of how to make herself agreeable to everyone. The longer I worked, perhaps like many people with a job, the better I learned how to fulfill these expectations with ease. I tried in this period of my life never to think about my job. If it made me feel like skipping a meal, I thought, don't let superficial evaluations affect you. Uh, if it made me question uh, uh, when I sold impossibly cheap clothing. I told myself, well, maybe I would be in the same position at any number of other jobs, even though these clothes are too cheap to pay people well. It made me ignore my body, like when I shot in a mini skirt in zero degrees. And it made me ignore my strength because it wasn't as valuable as my flexibility. Describing her time working as a model, Grace Jones wrote in her memoir, I am diplomatic now. I could run for presidency now, but it's tricky for me to be diplomatic. It does not come easy. You have to manipulate your own self to get the results you need without actually expressing how you really feel. Scientists say that expressing the expression of an emotion can reduce the feeling itself. In a study published in the Journal of Pain, uh, subjects who were told not to frown experienced less pain than those who are allowed to grimace when heat was applied to their arm. But the scientists write that people who tend to do this regularly might start to see the world in a more negative light. When the face doesn't aid in expressing the emotion, the emotion seeks other channels to express itself through. In other words, thankfully the body is not all grace. Once I remember standing in an air-conditioned changing room and seeing the client's multiple casting binders. They were labeled models, African-American models, child models, African-American children. All while hip hop and the N word is blaring through the speaker and the all white creative team is coming in to fit me for the campaign. And then my body, despite the freezing temperature of the room, begins to sweat so profusely that I have to clamp my arms down to keep that BO from permeating the small room. The body, because it is not made of money or patriarchy or racism, because it is alive, will be sickened by my complicity, will be harmed, will be exhausted, will sweat, will smell. We cannot acquiesce or dissociate forever. We cannot ignore our humanity because we are, after all, human. So uh, what is grace then? I want to tell you about the most graceful moment that I have ever witnessed, a little choreography I saw on St. Mark's and Third. A person, a dancer maybe, is walking towards me. Their arms are crossed against the cold. Their posture is impeccable. And from behind me comes an unwieldy person pushing through everyone and making everybody lean away, but the dancer they have headphones in and they look briefly up at the sky and they don't see this person charging down the street. And they collide, uh, they get body slammed, the force of their shoulders hitting each other and the harried person continues. But the dancer, they turn the force of this collision into a perfect 360 degree pirouette, land and keep going. I, I, years later, I wonder at this moment, I, how many times did this dancer have to encounter chaos to meet it with such poise, um, with such fluidity, with such presence? I think alchemy, the grace is alchemy, and it transforms carelessness into beauty. I have to say that I find it hard to give up that tenderness that arises so easily from being agreeable. And yet grace demands more of us. And so I propose this working definition. I wonder if we could say that grace is an effort to transform or transcend, something careless into something thoughtful, hurt into repair, violence into healing, conflict into growth, the mundane 
into awe because it springs from our deep appreciation of life. Grace is a powerful tool for resistance, change, and empathy. I think how on the days she could not express her dissent verbally, Ruth Bader Ginsburg wore a beaded scalloped necklace. I think of Anita Hill reflecting on the green suit she wore to the 1991 hearings, saying that she asked herself, do you look like someone who is credible? The night before I am supposed to shoot a national ad, my agent calls and tells me the client wants me to write environmental messages on cardboard signs. How will this be anything but greenwashing, I ask her. Well, she says, they cast you in part for your activism and they built a whole set around it. So I go for a walk by myself. Is it possible that the people I am working with actually want to protest? actually want to use cardboard signs to share something real. Because there are things an advertiser should say running on main streets across the United States. They should say divest from fossil fuel. They should say end white supremacy. They should say protect trans youth. They should say support the Fabric Act, a minimum wage for garment workers. And so on set, when I start writing, nobody interrupts me. Everyone is quiet. And when I finish, we hug because everyone there is clear. The whole crew agrees. Um, we, we got it. When the ad runs, the words that we captured are erased, are they're retouched out, and the signs are unrecognizable as such. They become a textured background. And so this, this teaches me something, that grace is different from compromise. This is why the words that we wrote were deleted. They were uncompromising. Grace is arriving and remaining ambitious and committed to our humanity, even if systems, rules, stereotypes, decorum, and the market want to silence us. Grace is being able to reach for repair, for imagination, for one another, to transcend conflict, hostility, and broken systems. And so, uh, what now? One of the strangest things about reflecting on a 20-year career in fashion is that the things which the body felt like cold often cannot be seen in photos. I've been organizing models for over a decade when the Me Too moment came, and after private conversations, we decided to use Instagram to share hundreds of stories of harassment and abuse. And it was entirely unsurprising, but also remarkable to hear how many stories people share that included the presence of a camera or when they were photographed, or just before being photographed. And yet these images are entirely indistinguishable from the rest of the fashion images. And so I think what a formidable stunt this archive would reveal were it somehow identified. When grace is an expectation, it makes us suppress ourselves in every moment that we cannot find our footing. And so grace is making allowances for people to show up hurting and exhausted, complicit and imperfect. I once learned from a brilliant teacher, Gibran Rivera, to ask, what is the most elegant next step? And so to close, I want to read a quote from a letter published two weeks ago by 25 MoMA employees who wrote, quote, regarding the ongoing crisis in Palestine, the gravity of the situation weighs heavily on our hearts and the absence of a collective acknowledgement or response from our institution adds to the difficulty. We respectfully urge our institution to consider the impact of its silence. I want to acknowledge their grace. They remind us, let us not confuse grace with silence. Grace is not about agreeability or ease. To be so confronted with inhumanity and yet to find thoughtfulness, to reach for words, to reach for each other, to reach to transcend and transform, grace is a gift. We are not entitled to it. When grace is extended to us, at the very least, we must make our best effort to return it. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. That was so beautiful. Thanks a lot. And now a video from Ocean Ramsey. Grace plays a crucial role in interspecies communication by fostering understanding, respect, and harmony among different species. 
It involves approaching interactions with an open mind, empathy, and patience, enabling individuals to perceive and appreciate the perspectives and needs of other species. Through grace, barriers caused by language differences can be transcended, allowing for meaningful connections to be established. Additionally, grace encourages peaceful coexistence and cooperation, promoting a sense of interconnectedness and mutual consideration between. Overall, grace serves as a fundamental element in facilitating effective and compassionate communication across species boundaries. Leonardo Bravo. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity, Paola. It was uh, such, so great to receive your invitation. And part of the grace under pressure was this maximum pressure of being able to present in front of a group of 150 people here in New York City. Um, I have recently <clears throat> moved to New York about eight months ago to start a new job at MoMA as Director of Public Engagement. And uh, when Paola approached me about this, um, we shared this interest in what is the role of diplomacy? What is the role of being able to work across communities, across differences, both within and outside of an, of an institution? So much of this is really about this fusion between the personal and the social for me to have this sense of grace under pressure. And what I'll do is just share a few touch points um, that have informed this work for me. Much of it has been grounded in thinkers and theorists like Stuart Hall, the incredible British uh, cultural theorist uh, that did so much work in terms of thinking about Afro-Caribbean, African diasporas in Britain, um, and thinking about these issues of identity, thinking about these issues of both being fixed and being hybrid, uh, both being centered and both being expansive, and how our longing to both define ourselves but also to open up those spaces of possibilities are things or concepts that have informed so much of my own work and diaspora. Um, writers like Gloria Ansaldúa and her work Luz en lo Oscuro, Light in the Dark, this notion of how we think about borders, how they define us, what is a border to begin with, um, you would think that so many frames and seismic shiftings would result in a fragmented, dislocated being, but this is not so. Such shiftings and fragmentations impel us to use our imaginations to figure out who we are and who and what we can become. I've been intrigued about this sense of becoming, this constant sense of um, unfolding, you would say. And it all started here. Uh, this is the young Leonardo. And... He was living down, way down there, uh, in the south of Chile. And this is what this young boy was looking at. Uh, my father collected all these Mapuche textiles uh, from Araucania. That is the region in the south of Chile that is informed sacred lands, Mapuche lands, um, that are inf informed by ancestral knowledges. And this is the work that I saw, these textiles that, as a three-year-old, I would look at. And these are, these are the visual systems and communications and cosmologies that I think have informed me so much in my own work as a visual artist and the way I frame the world. This is something else that I saw that informed the way in which the arts and culture can be a powerful force for social change. I was there in a moment in Chile when this political upheaval, political transformations and revolutions were taking place. My mother, her name is Graciela, which means graceful in Spanish, um, was an incredible force for social change, for social engagement, working <clears throat> with communities to uplift communities. <clears throat> Part of this journey also is about my own sense of coming here to the United States fairly late when I was 12 years old, coming to a new country, a new culture, a new way of being, a new way of adaptation in this world, and drawing from different sources to inform that sense of who I can be, that grace under pressure. People like Annie Albers and her incredible work in the Bauhaus. And I think about their trajectory, Annie and Joseph Albers, and I love this image of them. It is filled with grace and joy, radical joy. 
um, and the sense of Annie Albers coming from a place like Europe and Berlin, my partner being German, me having a little bit of a sense of the haunted history of Berlin and Germany. And I've always been drawn to this sense of, again, that space of possibility, that space of visual communication that can show us a different cosmology, a different way of being. Same with my fascination with somebody like Sun Ra, this very sense of alchemy that Cameron was talking about, the sense of transformation, the possibilities, the possibilities and the beyond, the transformation, the unfolding, the becoming of what we can be. Where human eyes have never seen, where human beings have never been, I build a world of abstract dreams and I wait for you. That to me is grace under pressure. <clears throat> much of my work involved very much what Willie was talking about, thinking about the built environment, thinking about communities of color. What does it mean about being a body of color within systems of oppression? What does it mean to embody and walk within neighborhoods, within communities that have already been, been prescribed? In Los Angeles, where I did much of my work, I started an initiative called Big City Forum, where I invited many folks, including urban planners and architects and designers and dancers and photographers and filmmakers, to think about these issues of what the built environment can be, how we can imagine places of possibility working actually in communities and neighborhoods in Los Angeles. <clears throat> Much of this work has also informed my own institutional work in places such as like the Palm Springs Art Museum, very much like Helio Otisica, thinking about how we bring the other into the center of the work, the center of the institution. This is a work on your right, my right, that um, brought the work of a weaver from Oaxaca, Porfirio Gutierrez, um, and also Carolina Caicedo, who is here in our atrium at MoMA. And then finally, thinking about what does this mean at MoMA? Um, what does it mean for the work of a museum that has, has had a long history of community engagement? But how do we think about this dedication to celebrating creativity, openness, and understanding that includes our commitment to being an agent of positive change in our New York City community? And how profound that is, what a profound call it is for an institution to center our work around that. And then finally, a very short example of that. Uh, this is a project that we recently did in public engagement with my team here. Um, it was called Another Way Out of This Box, A Day with Artists Who Make Books. We invited Black Mass Publishing, which is Kwame and Yusuf up there, and they are presenting in this very stage. And for them to select a number of small publishers um, and community designers to come up with workshops, engagement workshops, and thinking about grace, thinking about issues of presence, thinking about issues of how we position ourselves in the work, it is, again, this sense of how we can think about this sense of radical joy in the here and now. And what does it mean to transcend our own limitations when we find ways to encounter our shared humanity? And finally, a little bit of my own grace is the sense of how do I think about grace under pressure with my own children and my son. And that is an ongoing, lifelong work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leonardo. Thank you. Now we have a video from Eduardo Con. Hi, my name is Eduardo Cohn. I'm an anthropologist, and I work in the tropical rainforest of Ecuador. I want to talk today a little bit about grace, grace under pressure, and forests. Grace is an old word, it comes from us from the 13th century. It usually uh, refers to a kind of force that comes from above, from God, uh, that inspires and infuses our lives. Today I want to think about grace as a similar related force that comes from above, but that, that actually uh, emerges from below, um, emerges from the kinds of forests that surround all of us, the kinds of forests of which 
the rainforest is emblematic, but it's not the only kind. There are many, many other kinds of forests, and we all carry a forest within us. And those forests, if we can open ourselves to them, uh, can disclose something, can disclose a kind of emergent mind. That emergent mind, when we connect to it, is grace. And in these times of ecological destruction, ecological devastation, that kind of pressure that we all face, we need to learn to connect once again with, with that kind of grace. Here in Ecuador, where I'm speaking, uh, from where I'm speaking to you, um, there is a, a word for this. It's called sumac causai, sometimes translated as good living of when we read. But sumac really is, is, is harmony, graciousness. It's living well in harmony with grace in connection with the emergent mind that informs all of us, the psychedelic nature of life, the mind manifesting nature of life. Thank you. Yeah, go Eduardo. <laughs> and now it's time for Bill T. Jones. <laughs> I'm standing here. That's right. Yes, yes. Um, so I thought I would wing it tonight because I thought I knew how to do the song and dance. I am really impressed with the people I'm sharing the stage with. I'm really impressed with your opening. Um, how to get into this um, topic? I started tonight saying to my uh, co-panelists that I feel like I'm an imposter because I don't have grace. Just fishing, listening for God. When Arnie Zane uh, died, Arnie Zane was my companion. Um, and he died in my arms in our bedroom, the same bedroom that my husband Bjorn and I live in now. Um, it was surrounded by all of the people in his life. My sisters were there singing all sorts of things from Barbara Streisand that he loved to Negro spirituals. Arnie's mother and father were there. They'd had a tumultuous, we all know the drill, gay son, right? Um, the gay son was their shame, and then they realized when he was dying that he was a star. But it was too late. Or was it? They were there. I remember when Edith, in the traditional way, ripped her garment, and Lon uh, picked that, um, what was left of my love, picked him up in a sheet, and the Ambulance was outside, but we all remember those days of the AIDS crisis when you could get it. And these dudes were not coming in the house because they saw people who were, there was a guy there wearing a skirt, there was a this, 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 they knew these were queers, they knew that this was like, well, what is this? And they had to remove this body. So I just remember um, Edith saying, uh, as Lon, who was a big uh, Italian-American who had converted to Judaism because he loved Edith so much, carrying him, and she said, Bill, look at Lon. Look at him carrying his son. It was like Greek tragedy. Like, look at it. And I looked, and it carried him down the stairs, out, and the guys would not come in the house. They were wearing gloves, and they took quickly put him in the back of the car, and just as I am weak-kneed, and I go to touch the ambulance, and they buzz out of the driveway. And the next thing I know, I saw was his body, as ashes coming back. Grace, when one keeps living. Grace, not happy. Grace. So many things happened, there was a peace, called Uncle Tom's Cabin. There was a piece called Still Here. Everything caused a kerfluffle. The art world was not down with where we are right now. 
either you're doing politics or you're doing art. We don't ask that anymore, do we? Grace. So I say this because I want to get to the film I'd like to show you. I say sometimes that my heart has developed a callus on it. Right, Shane? You know what it looks like now, don't you? I behaved terribly a week and a half ago. I was a bully. I said something to one of my performers I should not have said. They all were hurt by it, hurt in ways that took me. I'm still trying to understand. My company was actually moving away from me. I said, you son of a bitch. How did you do this? How did you blunder, right? And how do you forgive yourself? I'm dealing with that even tonight, standing here. But I've been here before when I made works that got a lot of attention, sometimes terrible attention. I've been called a victim. I've been called a rabble rouser, dividing people because I've insisted on being called a black gay man. Why do you have to put a label on it? Now it's all cool, right? Um, kissing Arnie Zane on the lips at the Brooklyn Academy of Music after this crazy piece we did, and um, having someone from Merce Cunningham, a gay man, said, why did they have to do that? They're just rubbing our noses in it. The fuck? You can beep it. Okay. Oh, good, good. Anyways. Many, many things happen. I'm going to show you a minute and a half videotape that is, in a way, the most gracious response I've had to the alienation I feel in being alive. I was at Woodstock at age 17. I dropped acid there. I saw 300 and well, how many of were there, people bedraggled, living the dream of the age of Aquarius. I thought that's what the world was. I did not foresee Donald Trump. I did not foresee any of the shit that we're going through now. But I'd always come back to making that next piece. And the piece is about bodies. And the piece is about different bodies. Arnie Zane and I used to say that our company was a place where disparate personalities come together to overcome their disparities and place all their efforts to a higher purpose. Can you hear me, Reverend? All right. Yes, eye on the prize and all that stuff. Believe it at your risk. What we're going to see in the next couple of years, we're going to all remember this night about grace. I do not know what I would do when a gun is pointed at me. I do not know what it means to lose my home, my beautiful husband, and all of that. I have entitlement, but life has surprise. This is the way I push back. So the place is Charlottesville. The first <laughs> images you're going to see are really recorded, I believe, in Charlottesville on a, about Abraham Lincoln. And the way that when he died, he was so, so long that he had to lay on the diagonal across the bed. The piece is going to show you full nudity at the Brooklyn Academy of Music when we did a piece called Last Supper at Uncle Tom's Cabin, the promised land. Last supper at Uncle Tom's Cabin, the promised land. Were there, and I will say it, were there niggers on the stage? Are there niggers in this room? Inward, I'm sorry, folks. I don't, I'm not down with it. Can you bear the burden of saying the word? And I. And then there's the piece that we did at the Academy of Music, which was called Deep Blue Sea, informed by Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, backwards. So disturbing that you've got to turn it around and rediscover what it means. It's now Black, black History Pablum. Let's say that together Black History Pablum. Pablum, what you feed babies. I have a dream. You got to earn that shit. Grace. 
So let's look at this. And the person you hear singing is Estella Jones, my mother, who at age eight was with her brothers and sisters down on their knees as the white farmer takes out his manhandler and whips Big Mama, my grandmother, so they all learn that when he said you can't leave this plantation, you don't leave this plantation. And this is in the 1930s. That's the woman who's singing here, bringing the word, as she says, because she believes in grace. Her son is just trying to keep up. Let's take a look. Waiting in the water, children. Waiting in the water, children. Waiting in the water. God's going to trouble the water. Waiting in the water, children. God's going to trouble the water. We sometime up, we sometime down, we sometime almost held with the ground. Way in the water, children. Way in the water, children. Way in the water. God's going to trouble the water. When you're sick and you can't get well, God's going to trouble the water. Wait and the water, children. Wait and the water. Wait and the water. God's going to trouble the water. Beautiful. So I would like to invite you to join me here on my speakers. Please come. You can choose whichever seat you prefer. <clears throat> and I want to thank I you for these thoughtful end. presentations that were really, really touching. It seems to me there are several themes. You know, it's interesting because the question of what definition of grace we are using is still not answered. But I'm closer in the sense that what I've heard tonight teaches me so much. There were a few themes that were coming that, that seemed to be recurrent. One was the idea of grace bringing us together, this idea of togetherness. Then, uh, very important, the idea of alchemy, this idea of transformation. And it gave me a lot of hope because sometimes being graceless means that you have the function of being the collider, right? So you instigate grace. So maybe there needs to be pressure for grace to really express itself. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. Mm. And also the idea that we're not entitled to grace. So um, I, I don't even know where to start, but I have many questions and maybe you have questions also for each other. But is there a way to learn grace? Uh, or is it something that hits you like the collision? And I can ask you, Reverend, to start with this. I'm glad to. And thank you so much for your wonderful opening comments and your thoughts. Oh, that's all, Christina. Yeah. <laughs> Christina, thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you, Christina. I do, think, I do think grace can be learned, but what, are, what exactly are we learning? I think we are learning uh, a work of discernment, how to discern that we are inside a reality of grace. And I think this is the most difficult thing for us because that work of discernment requires that we can sense in the midst of pain and struggle and hurt and harm that there is something still at work inside of it. And in that regard, um, 
the question becomes, who can help us? And what can help us to see that joy inside of despair, that reality of possibility inside of sorrow, such that at the end of the day, we, we are not governed by the affliction. We are governed by something else. We don't ignore it. This is not a question of ignoring. But grace is always a matter of being able to see and yet see more. I think that's where Yeah, you talked begins. about making pain and suffering productive. And I wrote it down and I said, what, what can they produce? You know, that's what I, so it's the movement forward, right? Because that's something also that came from the conversations that Christina and I were having. Grace is, about, is progress, you know? So uh, once again, this idea of alchemy and, transport, and transformation. So mm -hmm. mm -mm. what do you think? Mm -hmm. Can grace be learned? I wish we could fast forward five years. And see what happens. We're all, everybody in this room is going to okay. understand this question in five years. Do you feel it? Do you feel the cloud? Do you feel what's happening? Do you feel what's going to be asked of you? That's how I answer the question by turning the question back over to the world. Because I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know. Everything I don't want to uh, bullshit. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, let's remember this question in five years, those of us who are still alive. Cameron? I, um, my gut is that it can be learned mm -hmm. and that frequently we don't see the people or uh, treat the learning of grace as the profound skill that it is. The people I have seen sometimes with the most grace are um, I think immediately of seeing uh, parents with many, many young children, and we don't really see parenting as a skill. Um, or I think of uh, in Brooklyn seeing um, young black children encounter police officers and learn grace in a way that I have never had to. And so maybe there is that pressure piece. I, uh, seeing you uh, reference your child at the end and, and you speak about the um, you know, built environment and you say, I don't know what would happen uh, if a gun was pointed at me. I think there's something about the pressure that is the teacher. And sometimes we don't see people who really have been, who have a PhD in that. Um, Leonardo, you said uh, that you also deal a lot with the built environment. You know, it's something that also came up when Willie was speaking. So, um, you just came to New York, but you have an experience of Los Angeles. And here, you know, we talk about New York all the time. So tell us about LA and tell us about built environment and grace. <laughs> yeah, no, hello. Don't we want to hear about LA? I, mean, I, um, I love LA with a passion. So, yeah, <laughs> I, you know, it, it's interesting because I think part of it is exactly what you were talking about, Cameron, is like this, this concept between the inside and the outside, the tensions. The uh, it's almost the terror of navigating a place, a space, um, without truly having a full toolkit, and you know, meaning how to, how to make. I mean, I'm intrigued in the sense of how we make meaning in the world, and in LA, there's a different, whole, very different sense of meaning making there than here. Um, and I was sharing this with Bill that I'm in Crown Heights currently. And I'm fascinated being inside of these tensions, these kind of parallel domains and realities that are constantly speaking oh, Heights, well. and not speaking <laughs> to each other. And I think from that, from that texture is where maybe, you know, like maybe an anthropologist or a sense of finding our ways into grace with, through all the pain, through all the divisions, through all the othering, um, when you begin to recognize the other that we all embody. Um, but back to your sense of LA, you know, LA is this sense of being, not being in proximity, uh, being far away, but having this ability to get to and from. 
I'm interested in being in the thickness, the mucky muck of life. And that presence that you speak about so well is so prevalent in as I've encountered my, my life here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to continue to ask you something because um, having heard all of you together and then having heard you speak about what MoMA can do, I was thinking maybe MoMA cannot really shed its being, its body, its presence in Midtown, its history, its board. Um, I wonder if we should embrace being the collider and make grace happen. And I think that that's what, in a way, you're doing. Like it's, a new, it's, a new, it's a new experience for you, but this museum is heavy in its presence and in its role. So can you embrace this idea of the collider? Yeah, I mean, I, I think very much like many museums or other museums I've worked at, but especially MoMA, I'm, I'm always, I've always been highly conscious of my sense of who I am and what I represent, a person of color and in institutions, especially at a leadership level. And what does it mean to create that space when the institution feels so fixed? And so how to find that space within the institution to make it softer, to make it more nimble, to create a space of possibility? I mean, that sounds very abstract. But like I showed you, that dedication to bring in those voices, those perspectives, those dimensions in a way that amplify and create more space. And it's not easy work. It's, it's cultivation. It's nurturing. It's connecting. It's relationship building with communities, communities that usually do not have a trust of the institution. So how to commit to that, how to center that in a way that is... Uh, there is a sense of reciprocity. Um, so in a way to think about all the resources that this institution can bring to bear in positive ways, in beautiful ways, in expansive ways, creating an alchemy inside the institution. You need a kind of faith, don't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, let, let's, just, right. let's talk about faith for a yeah. moment. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about faith. Yeah. You have faith, you have faith in the future? You have faith? You have kids? You all right with the world you're giving them? You have faith in it? I think that's when we talk about this topic, we're talking about faith, aren't we? Yes. And I don't mean necessarily religious faith, but what do you believe is immutable? Is I personally have very little that I find immutable right now. Mm -hmm. I love my husband, mm -hmm. right? I love some of the things I've made. But you know, most things right now, I feel the world would operate pretty well without me. But you've gone through so much already. So yeah. what's changed? Because I feel that those who have lived the AIDS crisis mm -hmm. have gone through, I mean, I have not because I was not here, but the trauma um, and the you've scars lived, you've lived such. Jake, you've lived Jim Crow? No, no, no. Oh, you've, you've lived in crisis. If you've lived in this country. I, I just lived the terrorist years in Italy. Not oh, I see. I no, see. no, 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 I didn't, mm -hmm. but, but I was, mm -hmm. I'm just saying, without comparing, just like my life was in Italy until I came here, but I missed so much. But I, what I'm trying to say is that... So, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah. Let, let's do this. Mm -hmm. So you feel that America, with its problems with race and all of that, mm -hmm. is somehow singular, that Italy does not have, those phenomena do not happen to you in Italy. No, they didn't happen to me personally because I was shielded. I'm not saying that they didn't happen, but to mm. me, yeah, mm -mm. I was pretty, you know, cocooned. Mm -hmm. But let's not make it about me. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I want to make it real. Okay, okay. I want the stakes to be high. Okay. You know. I, I, can I? I please. I, I see please. your your. Um, I hear your question of faith, and I hear it feel personal when you are wondering. Mm -hmm. um, for mm -hmm. yourself, you know, what, what is immutable, you say. And, I, and when you were speaking, you spoke of being the bully, you know, two weeks ago. And I, one of the reasons that I hold a small amount of faith is that feeling that everyone is the bully and everyone can have grace. Everyone is the collider and everyone can have grace. Mm. And that 
seeing, feeling my own self move through those things, seeing other people move through those different phases gives me some faith. It's beautiful the, what you're saying, but do you really feel that everybody has uh, the same vulnerability? I, do, uh, there are demons, I think, in the world in human form. I know it sounds, I think they're demons. There's demonic behavior, hell-bent, right? Psycho, uh, psychotic, so on. Um, so I don't put, I, maybe I should have a, a more, how dare I say, Christian heart and in, embrace all the little children. No, I, I think that there are some evil things in the world, evil things. So the beauty, your physical beauty and the beauty of your message is something that gives light. But I think we should not forget that there, are, there is the demonic forces. Demonic forces grow stronger every day. Now, I, I, I'm a paranoid, maybe. But have you noticed, do you, 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 you smell the air right now. You smell the so air. Sulfurous. Well, mm -mm. sulfuric, mm -mm. the camps, who uh, is going to be worth saving? Yeah, who gets fed? Right? Look at this institution we're in. God bless them. But let's look at the world. How does, I used to think that aesthetics was the thing that would save the world. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know if I believe that anymore. And if you ain't got that belief, Bill, then, then what do you got? I'm just opening it up here today, everybody. And I hope you do. I hope you yeah, do, too. No, okay, no, turn the light on. We're going we're gonna to then take some, uh, some questions from the but, audience. But, right, yeah, but I was I'm about saying, to ask you. Will. Bill, I appreciate you so much because you, you're being very theological at this point. Yeah. Which is, <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that what it's called? Yeah, you're being very yeah. theological. Because you, your, your mm -hmm. questions and your comments are really uh, infl inflections inside of faith. Mm. They're inflections inside of someone who wants to hold on to the possibility. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's so great about it, because which, to me what I, I hear you pressing is what actually is possible at this moment. And, and I think what grace opens up is for us to live in that question for ourselves. What is actually possible? Mm. And it's the, the gift is not the answer to the question. The gift is the ability to keep asking the question, what is possible? And this, for me, this does come back to the built environment, as you said earlier, because for so many of us, what shuts down the power of that question is precisely the way our environment is constructed, the way in which buildings are misaligned with bodies, and the hope of bodies being thwarted by the shape of buildings, the shape of neighborhoods, the shape of the way communities function. And so I think for me, grace means that we allow ourselves to inhabit the reality of the new possibilities of life together and to have the courage, even in the midst of the demonic, to keep asking what are the possibilities? Because here's what we know about the demonic theologically. It can be cast out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, 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 uh. Oh, no, 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 no. That was very We're slick. We're having an exorcism here. Very slick. No, 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 you're going to have to go further than that. What do you mean? Cast out. The pigs, yeah, the pigs going into the water and all the evil spirits come out of them? Exorcism. No, but I, I want you. No, no, that was, that, that was too, too, too smooth, my brother. Too smooth, right? Yeah, yeah, you said, yeah, it can be. It can be cast out. What, 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 what does that look like? It can be cast out. To be cast out always, in, be cast out always involves a couple, of, a couple of gestures. The first is the truth telling inside discernment. To see, to see someone tormented. And to see torment. And then and to use the biblical language, especially inside of the life of, of Jesus, it's to silence the demonic so that its voice does not become dominant in our ears. Hmm. The demonic voice wants us to talk like it, politically, socially, so to silence it. So I, I will not talk like you. I will not live my, let my voice yield to your way of, and then to step inside the reality of love. Love for all those others 
love even for the one who is being tormented and whose voice has been given over to the mind. It's, those are the crucial steps for us. And I feel like I would like to, I like not being in the way of the conversation, but I hope there's some very brave person out here who says that you, what you have just said, I don't know if we have deserved it, this belief that you have. You know, and it's beautiful, it inspires, but there's something it seems uh, that we'd have to like name the demonic in order to know if your prescription really balances it because it looks like they're winning. Well, see, I think that's always, that is always part of the pull. The, let's use another theological word, the temptation of the demonic to make itself larger than it actually is, mm -hmm. to make itself more powerful than it actually is, and for us to turn all our attention toward fear. And I come back to the great Howard, the great Howard Thurman. Fear mangles the soul, mangles the mind, distorts the soul, crumbles subjectivity. Because what we fear, we we yield to, and what grace and as I said, grace is the enemy of fear. Grace says to fear, I will collapse you right in the midst of your power. Mm -hmm. Those of us who are not Christian be believers, do we have access to this? Of course. Well, Hemingway was saying this. Of course, of course, yeah. of course. So how? Oh, oh, oh. So how? But, but no, How's that but, work? Well, <laughs> <laughs> the way it works, at the most simple level, we listen to each other, mm. and we do likewise. We listen, and we share. You don't have to have my faith to share in its possibility. Mm -hmm. But now, it does take courage to share, doesn't it? Hell of a lot of courage. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So do we have any grace under pressure? Oh, my god, we have questions from the audience. That's Is great. it possible to get more yeah. light in the audience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can, right? It's going to take a second, but we get there. Yeah, don't, you just start talking and it's, you don't have to touch anything. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah I had good. to touch something. Mm -hmm. Anyways, <laughs> hi, um, I'm Penmai. It's so great to hear from all of you. And the reason why I shot up my hand is because I have an immediate question in response to this. And I, I do really um, believe in this possibility or the, the, the nebulous space in which you can imagine possibility. But, um, you know, as a, an indigenous woman from Southeast Asia who has deep land connections and is someone that interacts with my world as a method of attunement. So I'm always in tuning to this interspecies um, language. I'm always attuning to my place, um, how I exist in relation to another, how I exist in relation to an institution. Um, and I find that Grace is possible when one is listening, but action is possible when both parties are listening. And, and in my journey of working in the environmental context, I'm an activist, I'm a researcher, I'm doing, like all of my work is about environment. Sorry, sorry, so, so sorry. All, this, is all to, this is all to say Take like, like, this is all to say like, how do you continue to do this work and this practice when you feel like you're the only one a tu tuning in or listening into, into the, the space of grace? I'll give a quick answer, but I'll, I'm certainly uh, my colleagues here will say something. The, the, the work for us is never to imagine ourselves alone. And, and that, that's a crucial work. I mean, it, it takes work. And what's so beautiful about what you said is that attunement is precisely at the site of recognizing the shared reality. The great anthropologist, uh, Arturo Escobar, would always say that our sense of relationality is based on our sense of connectivity. If we have a shallow sense of connectivity, then our sense of relationality will always be shallow. So to the extent to which you are attuned to the actual earth, to the land, to the birds, it's also a summons, a call to hear the heartbeats of those sitting next to you. Mm -hmm. So that in that reality, you recognize that, yes, you're striving, but you're not alone. And you fight against the hubris that comes with imagining 
that I'm the only one who sees the horror in front of me. Mm. It, is, it is that hubris that is also fundamental to our deception and our giving into fear. I am alone against the struggles in this world. I am alone see what is happening to the environment. I alone is shedding tears at night. We must walk away from that foolishness because at heart, what it does, it denies to us the gift that the land itself is trying to give us. We are connected. So you don't believe that we're born alone and die alone? Never. As because someone who's had children, yes. you certainly are not born alone. That is very inaccurate. Ay, 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 Bill. So you're born, you're born of mother, you're saying. And a number of other people who usually they're there to help. Mm -hmm. So this you is, have it's a, though alienation is an illusion. Yeah. Alienation is an illusion. I think we learned in COVID that, th that we have been taught that we are boundaried bodies. Mm. And we are absolutely not. Why, why do we all need to be vaccinated? I'm young. I'll be fine. Mm. No, because I affect each person that I come across. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, I heard Mother Power speaking, and now uh, you're, uh, I'm, I don't want to fall into your mouth. Because <laughs> I think you're a strong and believing person, and I came today purposely to be the, um, how they, my dad used to say, the devil was the, uh, the adversary? Interlocutor, antagonist. The uh, the, uh, but, the, uh, the adversary and the advocate, the adversary. right? Mm -hmm. So can this group, can this highfalutin conversation hold up to the reality of what's really going on in our name, even as we speak? But that's funny that you find it highfalutin, because this, this conversation is something that it's completely selfish that I generated out of despair, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? I wanted to find a way forward, and I am using all of you, all of you, <laughs> to learn, and I've learned so much. So it's the opposite. It's not highfalutin at all. It's so down to earth. And yeah? um, I think that despair is what allows sometimes for the attunement that you're speaking about, you know? That kind of moment of being so broken that, in a way, you need humbleness. You need to be humble in order to recognize that interconnection, that interdependence. That is essential, and that is in front of us. And many times, we, we, we don't cope. We, we don't see it. Are there there's somebody there in the middle? So can grace be disruptive, meaning pressure of grace under pressure? Mm -hmm. Who wants to take this? Can grace be disruptive? Well, it's con it was considered almost a weapon. So, do you mm. want to take it? No? <laughs> yeah? no? No, I've stepped in enough shit already, so I'm not... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's it, you know, keep... keep I'm like, not quite waiting. sure I understand the question, actually. Mm -mm. That's a great question. I think what you said earlier speaks to the disruptive reality of grace. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think grace can be disruptive. I think grace is a strategy. You know, I think when, we, when you, you mention Martin Luther King and nonviolence, this is a strategy, right? This, yeah. is the, this was the way yeah. to get to the next place. So I, I think mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's usually a good strategy, but sometimes also it's not. I think I'm reminded of Antonis Mokas, this mayor who was an artist, mm -hmm. and how inside various confines, be a lecture hall or sort of a political position, his creativity, and you might say in some ways gracelessness, but in other ways grace, because there was nothing, it was playful. It was always, uh, you know, if he didn't like what was happening, maybe he would pull his pants down, right, <laughs> on stage. Or, you know, he would do these things that are, uh, were... Displacing. All he, of a sudden, people were just like shocked. Out yes. Of their to what end? Mm-hmm. In that particular case, I, I, he was giving some lecture, and I don't know that, I, I can't remember, but he, you know, for example, uh, there was a big traffic problem where he was, and so he gave, like, stickers to uh, taxi cabs that were driving well, but also gave each driver 10 extra stickers to put in the window. 
And then because they didn't want to disrupt the brand of being a good driver, they were encouraged to give it to people who were also practicing safely. So And, mm. and, and pedestrians were giving also out those. Mm. So pedestrians would give those and then everybody had badges, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I um, talk about drop, drop trow. Um, <laughs> I was uh, out at the wonderful Longhouse in, Long, in, in, in East Hampton, Jacqueline Larson's gorgeous place. And they were doing a concert outdoors. And um, there was this moment, everyone, nice middle class and upper people sitting on the hillside, drinking, you know, and so on. And we were there. We were the entertainment, right? So there was someone sitting with two beautiful towheads, you know, two beautiful blondes, little children. So um, I uh, remember there was. I was overtaken by a demonic force. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I, I'm, I'm fucking with you, but I, there's a reason for it. But I was, I actually, um, the, the beautiful little blonde kids were sitting there with their, and I dropped my pants <laughs> and stood. No lewd gestures, right there in front of everybody, not in a closet somewhere, right there in front of them, and pulled it up, went on. And what happened? The father was so angry. The father was so, why did you do that? Yeah, why in the hell did I do that? <laughs> I, I, I know what was going on. I wanted to see, what, how does it, uh, what's it, is it Jenny who says, if you want to know, Jenny Holzer, if you want to uh, find out what a person really thinks, spit a glass full of milk in their face. And that, that's, what, that's what the perversity of art is, you know? And, and so, uh, no, I, I, I want to believe yeah. what you believe. Yeah, yeah. I want to believe. And believe me, when the apocalypse comes, I want to be on your team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in the meantime, while we have the luxury of sitting here and talking, which is what we're doing, uh, we have the luxury of doing this in a nice room. We're all dressed well. I'm assuming everyone had three meals today, right? Well, everyone had enough to eat today, right? Uh, this is what we do until the apocalypse. And you'll be, I'll be standing next to you. you know, <laughs> I, I love the way you just put that. Uh, you know, I, I think that grace is most disruptive, especially given what you just said about the apocalypse, when it resists violence, when it resists, resists violence. And when it says no to weapons. Even when you're being beat. Th this, this is the crucial matter. Mm -hmm. Grace says no to death mm. as a weapon. And this is the most difficult thing for us. Because, believe me, the most powerful weapon is death. And... No nation has been able to say no to it. And the question always, for each one of us individually, is can we say no to it? No to? Violence. To violence. Mm -hmm. okay. I just, I'm thinking what you said reminds me of that image of Tiananmen and the young man standing in front of a tank and allowing the tank to just run over him. If it would, he didn't, though. No, he did. He did. The oh. tank ran over him, and he died. So I'm just throwing that as an illustration of what you were just saying, the ultimate grace, the grace that survived through death. Mm. And we are still speaking of that man now. Mm. 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 Is that what we're talking about? Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Yasmani Arboleda, and I am deeply grateful to be here in conversation with you all. Mm -hmm. um, Antanas Mokus, I'm from Colombia. Antanas Mokus was the mayor of Bogota, and during his time there, he turned 2,000 police officers into 500 mimes who transformed the city and the urban environment by lowering 50% of the casualties of people who were dying on the streets by training police officers into mimes. So just one beautiful example of the practice that was named earlier. Uh, as I kept listening to the conversation about grace tonight, I kept thinking about the educator and the activist Cornel West, who differentiates the words hope and optimism 
he talks about optimism is the act of engaging in moving forward when you think things could be okay. And the act, uh, the, the word hope really speaks to the hope that things are going to be okay, even though you know they're not going to be, or there's very little information around the possibility of actually a good outcome. When I think about that person who was just referenced, I can't help but think of the person who just lit themselves on fire, mm. who passed away mm. on fire just days ago in Washington, D.C., in front of the Israel um, embassy. embassy. Mm -hmm. And I think about the gun that was pointed at them as they were on fire asking for a pre free Palestine. I'm deeply grateful tonight in this conversation for Bill Cameron naming things that are uncomfortable and engaging us in things that are very present in the institutional systems that we're existing through. When we think about the definition of hope, optimism, where those grays land, land us in the context of those notions. Uh, what were the two things you said? Hope, Grace and hope. I mean, sorry, uh, uh, hope and optimism. Hope and optimism. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's your friend. Yeah. What's that? That's your friend Cornell. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Mm. Actually, I think, um, uh, I think discomfort is everywhere. Like, you know, it's, mm. I have to tell you, having this salon tonight here, knowing what's going on, the friction, the letter about Palestine, it's like stepping in the thick of it. So I just want you to know it's, uh, it's really a place of discomfort and therefore also a place of grace. Um, I just want to take the stage no, is that, for a no, second. No, 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 oh, oh, that was pretty heavy. Well, it's uh, heavy, that, it's say, heavy say it one more time, what did you say? It's a I, place of discomfort and therefore and a, a place, place of, of grace. grace. Well, yeah, it's about everything that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, before when you were talking about being alone and instead Willie was saying, well, you're never alone, that's hubris. Or when uh, uh, Cameron was talking about the collision, I feel that grace comes from some discomfort sometimes. You know, mm. it's more productive when there's discomfort. And a few um, years ago, we did a salon on friction. Mm. That really was full of friction. It was one of the toughest salons, but also one of the most productive. And Christine and I have been thinking of doing a salon on bullies uh, that I don't know if we will do. But see, the, the topic is there. Well, it's, it also yeah. gets to like, how do we meet this moment? You know, mm -hmm. how do we meet the urgency of this moment when it's so raw, it's so palpable? Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, either we're vulnerable, we're broken, um, or we find the tools to find those connections, to find that attunement. But I do think this notion of rupture is important because we need to recognize that rupture. We need to recognize how uncomfortable we need to be within the rawness of the rupture and it's not just this tension between hope and optimism. You know, it's like, how can we freaking sit inside of just this rawness that maybe can point towards something? I think of language that I have seen, and I'm sure many of you have seen on the internet, saying, um, uh, let Palestine free us, or they are freeing us. And I think of uh, hearing you speak of the demonic, which certainly it's very difficult not to see on our screens and see in the news feed. Yes. But if we are going to be um, what you're saying, sort of graceful in the face of death, there is a different way to tell the story about what is happening, about uh, resistance, about truly a global majority that is very clear, I think about what is happening and what needs to happen and what humanity is. And there is a smaller group of people who do not see that, but who are loud in the current configuration of how, of how we get our information. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I, I think I hear, walk, walk, don't you get weary, walk, walk. Don't you get weary, walk. You know what I'm doing? This is slaves talking. This is slaves coming from the field in the evening and encouraging each other. Let's keep going. You've been working since dawn to the evening. So I think I hear what you're saying, right? I, who's going to be walking? Who's going to be walking? Um, 
I want to be worthy of this conversation, so excuse the asshole that I'm being, but I don't want low-hanging fruit. I don't want low-hanging fruit. This should not be an intellectual exercise. Oh, it's not. Oh, it is. It is. It is right now. We will know. You will know when it's no longer an intellectual exercise. You will know. You will know. And, and I think that this is the luxury of culture in New York City. We can come to a place that's well heated, well lit, and so on, and we could talk about things that are costing people their lives every day. It ain't costing me my life to be here tonight. I intend to go to a restaurant after this, right? But that's what we're talking about, aren't we? Yeah? So good, good, good. Walk, walk. Don't you get weary. <laughs> no, that wasn't an applause line. What is the song you sing that keeps you going? Hmm. What do you sing? What do you do that keeps going? Say what? What did you say? I'm so <laughs> I sing I'm so I'm sorry, I cannot hear if you, because of your clapping. What did you say? What, what is that? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I see. I see. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't understand. Okay, there was, there was leadership just shown there, right? Anybody else want to? What is your personal thing that keeps you going? I'm sorry? I take care of the others. Anybody else? They said some leaders in the room here, right? Mm. Uh, I, I teach children. Mm -hmm. Ah, you got quite a responsibility, don't you? Anybody else? Dancing. Dancing, how so? Um, because I feel like it gives me pure joy, and um, also dancing in a space with other people. I do a show called Five Rhythms, and that shows me, it shows you, it's like a micro. Anybody dare? Or does anybody have other questions? Because I want to give you the space for that too. No comments. Yeah, Elizabeth. Yeah, I just. Uh, it's coming the microphone to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess this works. Yeah, it works. Okay. Um, I keep hearing, like, there are lots of words, and the word that keeps coming to mind is anger. Because it seems like you can't do the work of grace without anger, and you have to be able to know. Um, and it's it's a life work. It's been a life's work for me not to be afraid of anger, to be able to identify anger enough to make it productive. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I'm not really good at asking questions, <laughs> because my job is not to ask questions. <laughs> not I, I don't have an inquiring position within this institution. But I guess uh, just throwing the word to you, back to you, because I feel as if you have each expressed it in a way, but no one's using the word anger. And for me, anger and faith are very important. They're, they're, they're equally important in terms of mm -hmm. doing now what about work. What about the, uh, the, the L word, love? Well. Love is part of it, too, because faith, love, and anger are not mutually exclusive. And, and it was coming to mind in terms of your performing yeah. as devil's advocate yeah. here Yeah, let's tonight. not deflect. Let's talk about anger, not about yeah. love. No, let's talk about yeah, what no. we want to talk about. No, 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 no. no, that no, this no, is, no. I'm saying love is no, the no, thing no. they tell is going to make it all better. No, no, anger, anger. Uh, no, no, I'm telling anger, you, on, love is supposed to overcome anger. Sorry yeah, to disrupt no, the program. No, no. It's this not is disrupting. Okay, good, no, good. Anger is love is supposed to overcome all things. Can I get a show of hands? Who believes it? Well, no, I don't. Love and anger are not I so enemies. <laughs> <laughs> love and anger are not enemies. 
Pardon? Love and anger are not enemies. Mm. There's a thing called righteous indignation. Sorry, say righteous, what's that? righteous indignation. Righteous indignation. Which means that one, in because one loves, one is angry. And because that's, one loves. Mm-hmm. And I hear a lot of love in you. Oh, there's a hell of a lot there. <laughs> but I, th- I think that means that love is not facile. Love is not, um, love is not, in a sense, badly sentimental. Love really is a work that involves the entire mm-hmm. person. And it faces the truth. So love, love, if it is truly truly love, it's, it's going to be angry. I mean, this is a moment to be furious. As you pointed out earlier, this is a moment to, to want to rail against that which is. But my earlier question is still very important. Can one love step into anger and not step into violence? I think that anger, if from a girl boss perspective, or from a um, uh, growing up in a patriarchy perspective, has been presented to me as a young woman as something to not shy away from. But I frequently feel that actually what I am, the emotion that I'm having is sadness, Mm. is grief. When you feel angry? Or no? Or what? I don't. I, I actually think that I that that, that um, sometimes uh, our culture says now you should be angry as a response, mm. and my response maybe is more grief, is more sadness, and I think it, we can be we we do not have to say that one is better than the other, or there is no place for one, but. Um, I wonder sometimes if uh, we are raising young people in a culture where we say to advance, we always need conflict, Mm. and that requires anger to be in conflict. And what happens if what we really are feeling is grief? Mm. Please, Lord, please, crying Savior, I want you to come into this house this morning. This is my mother's Christmas prayer. And that prayer would start with her singing like that, but at the end of it, she'd be wailing. That's what I thought spirituality was, this painful journey through all of these emotions we're talking about. Mm. That's what I thought the deal was. And I, I, I think that's what was behind the question, maybe, in a way. So we have another question. Where are the mics? OK, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Paula, thanks for having us tonight. Um, so my question is, we have all been in situations where we have been tense, felt overwhelmed, perhaps heated or defeated, and had to stand up and talk to an audience of varying sizes, perhaps your boss, the media, your wife. So how have the panelists shown grace in this moment? I'm not sure I understand. One more time, but what is, I think there's a challenge. You, huh? you, what, Can you repeat it? Again? One more time. What, once again? The question is, how have the panelists shown grace in moments of pressure? Oh, I, well, I mean, there's many. I think I can tell you that Cameron has a memoir coming out, a book coming out on March 19th. So she'll be telling you many of those stories. But I think... Uh, it's like a question that is almost impossible to answer because, first of all, it's so self-reflective that one would have to kind of like come up. But even when what Bill said about recognizing having been a bully last week, I mean, that's an act of grace to just go through that and try to... Don't explain for me, man. Don't it. explain for me. No, Don't, I, I think oh, I know no. what okay. you're talking mm-hmm. about. Mm-hmm. It is very, very expensive to really lay yourself out to a room full of strangers. Now, if you're asking for that right now, is that grace when I say that I love humanity and I love discourse so that I have no protection, which is a tendency that I find that I tend to do? That's that's my answer to you right there, is I try to live it every day, and I'm oftentimes a mess. But I think that that is what I believe in, that kind of brutal honesty and courage. 
Now, there's Bill's piece. What about you all? You don't have to answer. Yeah, we, I can take yeah, another one. Yeah, I can take the last one because we have time for one more. So <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let Bruno and Christina Pardon? decide who it is. Well, I, I, the question of love and anger and MoMA as institution, I was just thinking of Rana Vanna Fassbinder because his, his first and most important piece maybe was love is colder than death. Hmm. And his theory that made him made 50 films was exactly that contradiction or that paradox that loving someone would also mean oppressing them. There was more effective form of oppression than, <laughs> you know. So what is your dictum in a way when you're saying that the demon is outside, right? Maybe the demon is inside of us. Mm, we mm. both of that. Oh, it's definitely the real inside. question is, you know, how do we make art to do something that goes beyond that pain that we cause when we express the anger mm. that is maybe so righteous and justified? Isn't that an irresolvable paradox or an irresolvable contradiction? Mm. I'm sorry, my sister and I didn't choose the moment when you were talking about dance, I mean, about art. We should have got down here and thrown down. <laughs> Yeah, well, no, but I'm saying that's what I would normally do. That's what I would normally do. Two strangers meet together, vulnerable, in the eyes of their peers, and they are vulnerable together in front of others. That is my belief about how I would deal with that situation. It's not the appropriate one, but it is, that's why I believe in the human body moving. That's why I believe in it, because there's a truth to it. We missed our moment. <laughs> You still have time. You still have time. Well, not, not to misquote the reverend, but you did speak about fear eats the soul. And ultimately, um, how we think about this, this sense of finding, expressing a sense of radical joy in the fear, in the hurt, in the pain, I think that's an important takeaway for me about grace. Thank you. Oh. Mm. I would like to thank wonderful panelists. Thank you for this thoughtful presentation. I would like to thank you all for coming. I would like, as always, to thank uh, Christina Mushu for her wonderful, wonderful research. Oh, you know, have... And now, you know, there's like soggy snacks and so-so wine outside. So stay with us. Thank you. <laughs>